Welcome to Versed, the ASCAP podcast. I'm Eric Philbrook. Coming up on the pod today, ASCAP's Eitan Rosenblum gets some sound advice from producer and composer RJ D2, whose work as a solo artist and in collaboration with others has made him one of the modern greats of instrumental hip hop. But first, I'm super thrilled to share this conversation with our featured guest, Diane Warren. Hands down, Diane is one of the greatest songwriters in history. She has penned nine number one and 32 top 10 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. She is a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame and is tied for having written the most number one songs as a solo writer in Billboard history. She has received 12 Academy Award nominations. She is a Grammy winner with 15 nominations, an Emmy winner, and a two-time Golden Globe Award winner whose songs have been featured in more than 100 motion pictures. ASCAP has named Diane our Pop Songwriter of the Year five times. She was also named ASCAP Country Songwriter of the Year in 2003. In 2017, she received the prestigious ASCAP Founders Award. Recently, she won a Golden Globe and received an Academy Award nomination for the original song, Low C, Seen, from the 2020 film, The Life Ahead. Diane is the creative power behind countless hits, Because You Loved Me for Celine Dion from Up Close and Personal, How Do I Live for Trisha Yearwood from Con Air, Can't Take That Away for Mariah Carey, Unbreak My Heart for Tony Braxton, If I Could Turn Back Time for Cher, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing for Aerosmith from Armageddon, I Was Here for Beyonce, Till It Happens to You for Lady Gaga from The Hunting Ground, I'll Fight for Jennifer Hudson from RGB, and so many more. She is also the sole owner of her publishing company, Real Songs, the most successful female-owned and operated business in the music industry. Seemingly, her creativity knows no bounds. For proof, look no further than her recently released collection of 15 new original songs called Diane Warren, The Cave Sessions, Volume 1. It is her first recording released under her own name, and it features some of the biggest artists in the world handpicked by Diane, including Ty Dolla Sign, Marin Morris, John Legend, Luis Fonzi, John Batiste, Pentatonix, g Easy, Carlos Santana, Rita Ora, Sofia Reyes, James Arthur, Jimmy Allen, LP, Celine Dion, Darius Rucker, and many others. Almost four decades after kicking off her career, Warren remains an astonishingly prolific force. And who better to sit down with Diane for a talk about her new music than one of ASCAP's greatest champions for songwriters, ASCAP Executive Vice President of Membership and Chief Creative Officer, John Tita. So, without further ado, here is John's conversation with the divinely talented Diane Warren. Well, hi, Diane. John. Uh, So great to have you here, and congratulations on the album, The Cave Sessions, Volume 1. Thank you. I'm very excited. Uh, I love the record. You know, there's a saying, it all begins with a song. Well, this album proves that it all begins with the songwriter. Uh, because on this album, uh, you, the songwriter, are center stage. Um, so how long have you been planning the album? And has this always been a concept that you were thinking about doing? I've been thinking about it for a few years. It's, it's kind of more... You know, it's something that DJ producers have been doing for a while, you know, and, um, you know, whether it's Mark Ronson or, or, or DJ Khaled or, or mm-hmm. Calvin Harris, David Guetta, whoever they are, um, you know, it, it, they're right. They're, they're producer DJs curating a body of work right, with different artists. I thought, you know what, why why can't I do one of those, do the songwriter version of that and, and make it as varied as possible? Because, I mean, you know, just to show what, what I do, you know, so I'm, I'm, I write songs in all genres for all as artists you know and but so that was really important to me to kind of to make it very great so this is the most varied album you, you wouldn't even know the same writer wrote some of these songs you know agreed um and and uh while every song sounds like a, a hit single and it does uh this is uh okay. this collection is a real complete work the idea was i wanted everything to sound like hits i wanted it to sound like a like a greatest hits album well you did it. Um, and I will tell you, for the past few weeks, I've been doing something I have not done in a long time. I've been listening to a whole album in its entirety. I mean, uh, it's, yeah, and I didn't realize that this was an experience that I've lost in life until the cave sessions, because um, I look forward to it each time as a, a complete experience. Um, and, and actually, um, I mean, you know, I've my my voted my life to songwriters and and songwriting this is much more than an album release to me this is a songwriting event and um 
I guess I'd like to ask you, how long did it take you to write the songs for the cave sessions? You know, you know, some I had, some I wrote for this. And I kept. I, I'm always writing. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty prolific. So I'm always writing new songs, and that kind of made some of the, of the process of this record frustrating. So I kept taking ones off and putting new ones on. You know, I mean, I had. You know, the first the first song I had, which kind of started this whole thing. It, you know, it was John Legend. Where is your heart? Uh-huh. The song that he did. You know, you know, like seven years ago, whenever he did that. And he was supposed to put it on his album, and he didn't. I kept giving it to other artists, and he didn't want it back, and he, he wouldn't use it again. And it's such a great song and great performance, just him at the piano. I was there when he did that song. It was it was so magical. I was so determined. Even when other artists did the song, it, it wasn't as good as what you couldn't touch John. Right. So, like, as, as, I, as, I, as this whole idea was formulated in, in my Features album, I'm like, that has to be on there. But that there was no way that that wasn't going on there. And then I had a couple other songs like that. And then it kind of grew, you know, in the last few years. And there was a little handful, and I kept, I keep changing the other ones, you know. I keep, I kept writing new songs. You know? I wrote, um, you know, times like this, in the pandemic. I, you know, I thought that was a great song for Darius Rucker, so I called him. You know, I wrote She's Fire, you know, and, and thought of putting, you know, Cheesy and Santana. What a cool, weird combination. But it really. Right. I, I, I wrote the song more for Santana because I, I wrote that little guitar lick at the end of that chorus. And oh. We got to G Easy. You know, and, you know, I, I like putting weird things together like pentatonics and John Batiste. You know, that you wouldn't. I mean, I, I met pentatonics to my dentist, you know. <laughs> now, I've heard something about this. So, how does this happen? <laughs> and my dentist said, you know, you need to work with pentatonics. And I go, okay, set up a Zoom. So, you know, my dentist was on the Zoom with us. <laughs> um, and. and <laughs> This year's Oscars, and I know I know John Batiste. I was trying to figure out who I could put pentatonics with. And by the way, my album was all, was basically done, you know. So I, again, I keep kept changing stuff. And when I wrote "Sweet," I thought I really it's such a happy song, and people were getting back into the, the into life, and it's like this positive, um, you know, message. You know, and, and at the Oscars, you know, I, when I lost my twelfth time, and John Batiste on his first nomination won, you know. <laughs> but I, but I, you know, he's yeah. a great. I was happy for him. And, but I saw him there and I, I go, oh, you're, you're perfect for this song I just wrote. So, you know, I, I, I got him and Pentatonix together. I thought that was really, I thought that came out really great. It's it was, it's amazing. I was going, one of the questions I was going to ask you is how did you decide to pair them together? Was it an accident or was it planned? Well, it was, it, I wanted to pair them with somebody. I just didn't know who. And I went to John. I'm like, oh, because John, John's so, such a positive character, you know, he, he, he's positive. You know, and then some of the stuff was like just doing something really unexpected. Like I wrote "Drink You Away," which I wanted on the album. I, I really like the song. Uh, you know, Ty Dolla Sign hasn't done something like this. You know, that that'd be really cool, weird. Which, by the way, he's he's amazing. Is this uh, great? That's one of my favorites on the record. I think that's a hit record for him. And it's totally different. You know, and then then I'd have a song like um, "Not Prepared for You" that I wanted on the album. And Lauren Haregi, I, I think she's a great singer. You know, but hasn't done the right song yet. And what I love to do, what I've done in my career is find that right song, you know, for an artist that takes him to, to the next level. You know? Yeah, th- that's the one that keeps creeping back into my head um, all the time, not prepared for you. Yeah, it's such a, I mean, it's, it's a great song, but, but her performance of it is just fucking insane. You know, how she hits those notes at the end and stuff. And I just, I just think it's a huge career song for her. Even even on, on YouTube, there's just audio that's almost in a million views. Just just my album cover and her voice. So that and that song is clearly connecting. So I can't wait to really get that out. There. So you're kind of I mean to me the 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 album kind of takes us on a musical journey. Yeah. It, to me, it's like a masterclass in songwriting. Uh, as you said, they're so diverse. You cover just about every style and genre, and you have many guests and friends. So, and you're kind of talking about this now, but the question I was going to ask you is, did you write certain songs with certain people in mind, or did you cast them after you wrote them? That, it's, it's, it's casting, you know. I, I had the songs, or I wrote the songs, I was writing at the time, and I go like, it's just like what I always do. It's like, who's the, the perfect, it's like casting a part. But then sometimes I would just go like, well, who's, Who's not the perfect person that would be really cool? And again, back to Ty right. Dolla Sign. It was that, like, never think that that would be a Ty Dolla Sign song. But that's what makes it cool, you know? Or I had Domino, and I, oh. and I had LP for a long time. I'm like, oh, shit. So then, 
fucking awesome LP because it's, it's kind of a weird spaghetti western weird song, but but yet it's really accessible and it needed a cool cool voice on it. Yeah, I first saw her at the Songwriters Hall of Fame. She uh, I think inducted Woody Guthrie's catalog or something, and who I was just blown away. And what she does on the album, it's that's yeah, right. a that's a foot stomper, that one. Everybody really loves that song. That seems like damn. Yeah. And she was she was she was perfect. Perfect. And then like I wrote I Saved Me and I thought this is a perfect song for Marin Morris, but I didn't know her. So I, I private messaged her on, on Twitter. You know? Yeah. Well, um, you know, that one. Um, you know, I as I listen I have an experience as I listen to the album. So and there's like this like party atmosphere with she's fire and seaside and sweet and um and then i think it's louise fonzie right and yeah. then and then there's to me it's like at that point it's like the first showstopper marin morris that song it was it, it's, it's unbelievable thank you i'm really proud of that I yeah you. you know and i said cast before because I, as i'm talking about the album and i don't want you to think i'm feigning the, my obsession i i am i mean there is an arc to the album like a movie in a way because each song is like a new scene telling a new story and some and i'm wanted to talk about this i actually feel like are related to each other and i don't know did you feel um that as you were putting it all together you know what, I, what i discovered after the record was done there's two opposites i did a, i did the Mary moore song i saved me and then i did a song with celine dion which is superwoman which is, i'm not i'm not a superwoman so it was kind of like oh wow that's cool to have like the opposite two opposites on, on one record right and 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 i did notice a superhero self-empowerment theme running through the album on as you say i say i save me you say don't need no superman then there's the superwoman song and then you mention not needing a superhero and you actually mentioned kryptonite in in uh, domino was this con was this conscious or no it just kind of happened just creep, wow you know but uh, you mentioned that times like these, um, you know, you you read it, you, you wrote it during the pandemic time. Yeah. I mean, that's and I just saw the video uh, filmed at the Ryman, which is powerful, so beautiful. Um, but uh, what a song! Really, an inspiration. I saw um, the two videos, "She's Fire," "Seaside," that you you do like a, an Alfred Hitchcock cameo in both of them. I do my Alfred. Hitchcock bartender cameo, <laughs> but somehow I became the bartender. One's uh, kind of, and she's fire. I'm kind of like this mysterious dark kind of thing, and in Seaside, which I uh, kind of in a white suit. Well, I I saw the cocktails as a metaphor for the songs. You were you you were making the songs. You were making the drinks. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was serving the songs to the artist. <laughs> that that um. Um, well, first off, both videos are. Did you, uh, I mean the the, the she's fire video? Uh, by the way, G Easy. I mean Carlos, of course, amazing all the time. G Easy's performance on the song is just stunning. I love it. I love that record. You know how it happened was so. I, when I wrote the song, I I, I wrote the song. I wrote this that little that little guitar piece, you know, part, and I, I wrote it hearing Carlos in my head. And I usually don't write a song hearing a musician in my head. It's more right. Like, um, but, I, but I reached out to him and he loved the song. He did his guitar and it was like, oh, who to sing this? I was kind of going through a lot of people. I couldn't figure out who. And just that morning, um, I was kind of, how am I going to do Like, who's going to do this? A friend of my friend, Holly, who's good friends with, with, um, with G-Easy, called me just randomly, said, you need to work with my friend G-Easy. I'm like, oh, ding, ding. Perfect for, for She's Fire. She gave me his number. I texted him about it and said, yes. I go, well, wait, you haven't heard the song yet. Goes, I'm gonna do it. I go, but wait, I'm gonna send you, like no one's ever said yes before hearing a song, and, I, and I'm sure it wasn't yes to me. It was, it was, it was yes to Carlos, but it, it was still cool that it, that it did that. But he, but he loved the song, and he worked really hard on it. And, you know, it, did a great job because he doesn't usually sing. You know, he's a rapper. His rap, yeah, is, I, yeah, it was the, so the, so right great. Worlds that thrown on a song that creates another world. That's really, I love, I love it. And I mean, Seaside's a party. It's just in 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 song and in video. Um, yeah. You know, it's there's such you know dark times we're living in on so yeah. many levels that 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 song just kind of you could just close your eyes and and you're on if, even if you can't get on vacation. 
I, I like to say that you, if you can't get to the seaside, that, that song brings the seaside to you. Yeah, no, did you, were you involved in the concepts of the videos also? No, no, I wasn't involved in that. Okay. Um, yeah, it, 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 we do need uplifting. And like I say, the album kicks off like that. And, um, and then um, I, I have to, you know, you mentioned John Legend before. So uh, where is your heart? Now, in, in my personal listening experience, this beautiful song uh, kicks off, I think, and I hope I'm not extending myself here, a stunning trilogy of like the most unique breakup songs. There's like three of them. It's Where Is Your Heart, Drink You Away, and You Go First. Uh, did you plan that sequence that way? Or is this just my perception? It kind of, you know, I didn't, it wasn't exactly planned that way, but it kind of fit the way, the way it was. But you're right, you know, you're right. They're different. But You Go First is, I mean, is such a great song. I mean, I was, when, I, when, I, when I wrote that, I was hearing James Arthur. I, I, that's one I really wrote with somebody in yeah, I have to say that whole, I mean, that was uh, the idea that it's so painful to one person about the break, that asking the other person to leave first because they just can't bear to do that. And I for a video like that, it could be so powerful, but it could be like, like, like old people, you know, can you imagine like two old people right. have, have like a concept for, for a video? You know, yeah. So that's like a real great moment. And once again, Ty Dolla Sign, what, what a performance. It's great because it's, it's, he's never done anything like that before. You know? So it's like this hip hop country song. You know? really. He nailed it. Yeah, well, we talked about Not Prepared For You, which is this bluesy, it's just amazing. You know what's um, cool about that? And I didn't think about this until after that, until after we did the song, is it's Not Prepared For You. It has that gold group sound. Right from the 60s, which I well, love. It was, to me, it was like a Motown song in a way. One more, more, almost like Phil Spector wall of saying. Yeah, yes, 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 even more so. You know, so somewhere between in those worlds, right? But, but I thought like it's from, from those kind of girl group things. And then you have Lauren from, you know, from Fifth Harmony and a, a modern girl group, you know. So it was kind of cool to put those worlds together, right? You know, like, yeah. you know, 50 years ago, like, <laughs> yet the song's you know, it's, it kind of harkens back to that, but yet it's sonically modern. So like I said, every every song uh, could be a single and top every genre chart. <laughs> That's yeah. That was my dream for you. Be on top, number one on every Billboard chart with each. I'll take it. <laughs> with each genre. Um, yeah, Darius kicking it with uh, times like these. Then there's the beautiful Grow Old With Me. Yeah, I love that song. Yeah, it. It, it almost seems like the album resolves into some sort of redemption toward the end of it. Yeah. Um, it brings you on a journey, and and then and then uh, that comes on, which is stunning. And then I love blessings. That song. It's such a cool. Song. It's basically, a girl, basically about meeting for the first time. And that's what's what's fun about that song lyrically. You know, it's like basically they just met and they're asking each other to old. grow old. Yeah, I think it's a great wedding song. I I have I, I wrote a note about that <laughs> like the wedding song uh, absolutely and then as I was going to say it 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 lands with the song blessings with yeah. just kind of like times like these I think the world really needs this song I mean I think the whole album in a way has healing powers um, which I think songs do, but um, you know this song really uh, it's about the trials and, and tears of life, the life lessons. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I was going to, I was, go I'm sorry, what were you going to say? It's, I really wanted to end the album with that song. You know, it's a, it's just, I love what it says. You know, that that all the all the shit you go through. You know, you don't know it at the time because they were lessons, they were lessons. I think that. Was yeah, I was going to ask you if it was autobiographical, but then I there was a moment where I thought it was about me, and then I started thinking, that's what? that's what everyone's going to everyone's going to identify with that song, and um, I want everybody to identify with all these songs because you know it's like when we grew up song you know with songs we loved you know we made them part of our life. That's what I hope people do. Little thrills of our life are those, are those songs uh, that brought us here. Um, what were what were the um, recording sessions like? Uh, were any of the sessions that really stand out in your memory? Or I remember being there when John Legend sang "Where's Your Heart" and being just 
like the, the breath was taken out of me. It was so great, you know. Um, I was here when LP sang um, Domino. That was fun experience. Who else sang here? Lauren sang here. Um, not prepared for you. And that was that was amazing. A lot, but a lot of this other stuff was, you know, because of because the lockdown. Yeah, yeah, um, but I think it all adds to the atmosphere of the album, what was going on in the world, and um, yeah. and um, yeah, it's just just beautiful. So you, you you call the album the Cave Sessions Volume One. Yeah. So please tell me you're working on Volume Two. Well, there already is Volume Two. Some of the songs because I couldn't, like I was saying before, I kept, you know. Like writing new ones and going, well, no, I'm going to take that one off and I'll put down the next one. And, and a couple of songs that aren't on this album are really great songs. You know, I, I, in hindsight, I kind of wish I did put them on. But I could only get 15 songs on here. Right. So I have a few already. And I'm already thinking when I'm writing and things I'm, I'm working on. Like I'm going, like, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'll have them do it. You know, so I'm, I'm already thinking like that. Right? I mean, I'm always writing. You know? I'm right. writing. Best songs. Uh, you know, you're part of a unique group of songwriters like Cole Porter and Irving Berlin that write both words and music. Um, was this not always your, huh? Not a lot of us. I mean, I'm, not saying <laughs> no. I'm, I'm not saying I'm on that level. Those guys, I'm, I'm, I'm well, saying, I'm, I'm saying, I am. I'm saying that. I am. Well, I am. I'm saying that. Um, was this always your goal as a songwriter to be self-contained like that? Well, I've always done. You know, right. I've, I've yeah and um i have my process i i like i love doing this i i, I like to make something from nothing try to make it as way as i possibly can and i work best alone got it well um you know, there were, you know look i did have collaborators I'm, I'm not a rapper <laughs> you know like um i wasn't gonna write she easy's rap so and i don't speak spanish so so some of those songs are in spanish right well but i mean on the cave sessions you you, you look, I can make the argument, the Irving Berlin argument right now, because anybody who's listening to this now, you got to check out the album. This album will move you lyrically and musically. Um, I, I, I'd like to get I'd like to just talk for a second about, um, um, you know, movies and the Oscar. I mean, your songs have been featured in in more than a hundred films, and you hold a, a historic record here. You're the most nominated female in Oscar history, with twelve nominations. In any category, in Oscar, in the ninety-three year history of the Academy Awards, you have been nominated this many, many times and not have won. Yeah. Wow, wow. But you know what? I, if I had to choose, and I mean this, if I had to choose winning an Oscar, you know, twenty years ago, say. And then never getting nominated again or getting nominated 12 times, I will hands down say just being nominated wow. 12 times. Because what, if you think about it, it, what an honor it is to, there's only five songs as a, you know, look, the Grammys have different song categories, but the Oscars, you know, has one. There's only five songs chosen. And the people right. that shoot them, you know, the branch of the Academy, it's not, you know, they're the best composers on the planet, they're the best living. Composers, lyricists, and, 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 and songwriters that are alive too. And if they pick five songs and you know, one of them is mine, I am deeply honored and humbled by that. And, and to me, that's a giant win. So whenever that you know, that happens, I don't take it lightly. You know, whether you win or not, you know, yeah, would it be great to win? Yeah, you know. But I'll, I'll I like, I, you know, I'm, I, I like, I like being in the game. I love the longevity. I love being in the game. I love, um, I love the the respect of, of people like that. It's it's a, it's, a, it's great. Right, and uh, I guess it looks like you have another contender this year because I've heard the Reba uh, song uh, "Somehow You Do," which you wrote for the film Four Good Days" with uh, Glenn Close and Mila Kunis. Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I wrote that song for the movie. I wrote that during the pandemic as well. And I, and I was, you know, when I write a song for a movie, you know, it's, it's the main thing, obviously, is it has to be the, the, the song has to work for the movie, right? But in the best case scenario, it will work outside of the movie too. And it, it was just like kind of when the pandemic was starting and a lot of people were really struggling. 
you know, and a lot, a lot of depression too. You know, the movie is about drug addiction, um, but there's a lot going on, and I and I wanted to write a really positive song that, you know, no matter what you're going to go through, you know, um, you know, you know, when you think it's the end of the road, it's just because you don't know where the road's leading. They, the mountains too high and the oceans too wide, you can never get through. Some way, somehow, somehow you do. But it was like the the, 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 the strength of the of the human spirit that will get through it. So, you know, I love the song. And then when Re Reba McIntyre did it, it was like pretty, pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. Um, okay, so this is going to be the most fun thing I have to ask you. Because I know uh, that, like myself, you are a Beatle fan. So I have to bring up Here's to the Nights, yeah. which was recorded by Ringo Starr with a whole bunch of all-star people. I won't go through all their names except for one person, Paul McCartney. So, okay, Ringo and Paul, two Beatles recording your song. Talk to me. Myself. So Ringo asked me, <laughs> he'd done a song like years ago, and, and he asked me for a song, and I, I thought of Here's to the Nights, but then I came with a concept in my mind. It's kind of like this sing-along pub song about your, you know, with your friend. You know, here's the nights we won't remember with the friends we won't forget. You know, um, it's very sing -along. And and so I, I said to Ringo, "What if we get your old friends, all the old, Paul McCartney, Paul McCartney, <laughs> bright lights, and we'll get some new, some new, your new friends. Let's get, you know, Phineas, and Chris Stapleton, and Cheryl Crow, and Dave Grohl, and all, all these other people that were on there. You know, but the main thing." Let's get and, and Paul McCartney said yes to him, and I and I'll, if I'm having like a bad day or something or bummed out about something, I'm, I turn that on. I, I see Paul McCartney and Ringo singing my song in the and, beginning of that video. There they are, right? I was the biggest Beatles. I mean, still am. I'm such a Beatle fan. Um, and just the fact that I have Paul McCartney and Ringo. I have two Beatles singing on my song. <laughs> One, you know. So and, I. I have my glass of water today. I used this for you today. It's Ringo. It's my Beetle glass with Ringo. I did that for you. Original one, isn't it? Huh? Is that an original? Like from back in the day? I no. It's just a reissue, a reput together. You know, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. not the real thing. But it works. It holds my my uh, my drink. Um, so yeah, thanks for talking about that because I just couldn't imagine how excited you must have been. Um, we have a lot of listeners here who um you know who look up to you as the iconic songwriter that you are today and have been for decades but you didn't start out there you started out like other songwriters and uh at the beginning of your career as a matter of fact i understand you were actually in an ascap songwriter workshop very early on i was i think in 80 or 81 i was like three <laughs> that was in there really Horton. Um, and i i'm still friends with some of the people that, that were in there with me how different is the world for a songwriter starting out now from what it was then? I mean, it's never easy, whether it's now or, or then, you know, it, you know, the hard thing that I'm making a living at, you know, and probably harder now, you know, with streaming and all that, and then, you know, with lots of writers on songs, I don't know, I don't know how, I mean, you know, that would have been starting out now for me, but, you know, it's never easy, you know, right. so you got to get... You just got to put in the time and the work and, and, and get, not be good. Right? That, that part never changes. It's never yeah. easy. Listen, I, I, I think songwriters are among the most important people on earth. I, I truly believe a note can change a day and a lyric can change a life and a song oh. can change the world. And yeah. your songs have been making this world a, a much better place for a long time, Diane. So um, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for being a part of the ASCAP family and uh, thanks for being here and doing this today our next guest is a master of a very different kind of songwriting for two decades now producer and composer RJD2 has served us a steady stream of funky colorful beats sometimes in collaboration with Massive Attack Tycho or AC alone sometimes with his own bands Icebird and Soul Position but RJD2 is probably best known as one of the masters of instrumental hip-hop. His debut album, Dead Ringer, is a total classic. And if you've ever watched an episode of Mad Men, RJD2 wrote the theme. He's got a terrific new video course called RJD2, From Samples to Songs, available from Soundfly, one of our member benefit partners. ASCAP members get a 25% discount on a subscription. Log into your member access account for full details. We've also got some info in the show notes. Now, here's ASCAP's Aton Rosenblum getting some sound advice about making beats without rhymes 
from RJD2. RJD2, welcome to Verse the Ask Hat podcast. Thanks for being here, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time, back since the Dead Ringer days. Uh, I remember that uh, Ghost Rider was on like so many mix CDs that I made and that people made for me back in the Thank day. You. Thank you. Loved your work with Diverse and AC Alone and everything. So oh, honored to you have so you much. here. I, uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate the kind words. So you have a video course with our member benefits partner, Soundfly, that's out now. Yes. Um, what I've seen of it is terrific. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. But um, for now, I, I wanted to talk about something that you're a renowned expert in, and that is crafting these incredible instrumental hip hop tracks. So I wanted to unpack your process for that a bit today for all the producers uh, that are listening. So just to start off, could you tell me some of the music that most inspired your own vision for what instrumental music can be? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I came into Dead Ringer uh, coming from a place of being a producer in a hip hop group for, uh, you know, I think five years or so previous to the release of that album. And so uh, up until that point, a, a huge part of what informed my sensibility about making quote unquote instrumental hip hop was just rap music, you know? And uh, uh, I think a big part of it was buying 12 inches from rap groups, whether it was, you know, Tribe Called Quest or Busta Rhymes or whatever it is, you know, any of the hip, 90s hip hop, 80s, late 80s, up through the late 90s hip hop, you get a 12 inch and you have the instrumental often on the either the flip side or on the A side. Um, and that was just the song minus the vocals. Uh, and as silly as it may sound that I think having those instrumentals was a, a big uh, informer of what I ended up doing because you know, as a DJ, you'd find yourself in a situation where you'd, you know, you'd want to play some instrumentals, but just being frank, the instrumental versions of rap songs weren't designed to stand on their own. You know, they they frankly get boring after two and a half minutes or so. Uh, but there is something to listening to just the beat from, you know, uh, Electric Relaxation or Woo Ha Got You On Check or, or so on and on and on and on. Um, so there was a world of instrumental hip hop that existed from maybe the, you know, 95, 96, obviously shadow introducing was kind of like the, the benchmark, if you will, to date for a, a full length album that was instrumental hip hop. Um, and that album was kind of the other thing that I would say, showed me, okay, you can do this. You can make an album. So I, I, I in no way would ever take credit for being any kind of like uh, frontiersman or whatever, as it relates to instrumental hip hop. A lot of people did it long before me. Um, the thing that informed me the most would probably be this idea that that world of instrumental hip hop had kind of grown to be so much of an offshoot that it didn't have a whole lot in common with rap music and current rap music. Even though a lot of the people making that type of music might have been fans of rap music, my aim was to bring that sensibility and energy that you would get from a Busta Rhymes instrumental to the world of, uh, or the concept of making songs that stand on their own and evolve and feel like a song, not just a beat, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, I, I was having that that, uh, that that thought while I was writing these questions. So like, okay, so what makes instrumental hip hop, hip hop? You know, is it, <laughs> is it just the fact that there's a four four beat uh, yeah. or is there there's something more more cultural and less stylistic or, or what? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really that question right there is kind of the core question at the heart of effectively my whole career, I feel like, because one of the things that I learned early on is um, it's kind of easy to there's a there's a trajectory that happened very often in the 
from the early to mid to late 90s with rap fans. Uh, it was really common that people would love Native Tongues and Beastie Boys and whatever. They liked their thing. And then as the mid 90s became the late 90s and rap evolved and grew and, you know, the bad boy era came and, you know, G-Funk came and went. Uh, increasingly, a lot of the fan base for that, for rap music, became disenfranchised with the lyrical content of it. And right along with that, in lockstep with that, were the people making those beats and that wanted to make those beats and the DJs and, you know, so on and so forth. So it was really common in my world that you would talk to people and they'd be like, I used to like, in 19... 96, 97, 98, 99, it was often that people would say, I used to like rap music, and now I, I listen to DJ Crush and Mo Wax and Ninja Tune and Skin, because I don't really like rap anymore, you know? And so it was very easy for, culturally, I think a lot of the people that were making beats to almost take it as like a, a detour around rap music, if that makes sense. And for me, it was like, I never really wanted to make instrumental hip hop as an alternative to rap music. You know, I still was in a, a DJ in a rap group and it was easy enough for me to find rap music that I liked. Um, so to me, that, that was kind of like the challenge became not how do you make instrumental hip hop, but how do you make instrumental hip hop that still has that feel and sensibility of rap music. And really the only way I've found you can do it is to have experience making rap records. It's something that you continue to do to this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to love. You have to love rap music. You have to care and have a vested interest in rap music to be able to appreciate and kind of get inside that mindset of what works in the world of hip hop and you know what's going to work for a rapper. You know, and if you can take that kind of core, je ne sais quoi or whatever it is, and apply it to an instrumental song, that is in a nutshell what I was trying to do. What are those things that differentiate between a song and a beat? Like, I, I guess a, a different way of asking it is, what are some of the qualities that you're looking for uh, in the music you create that help keep it listenable the whole way through, even without a vocalist? Um, you're probably familiar with a, a term that's uh, in vogue these days called code switching. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, that is kind of my core technique when it, comes to how do you take a beat and turn it into a song. And for me, that, that applies in, in the manner of reassessing how I am listening to what I'm doing, kind of on a, loosely speaking, a 30 second to 45 second to 20 second to 60 second markers, if you will. So, uh, you know, obviously, when you, for me, when I start something, I'm kind of thinking about the technical aspects of it. What key is it in? What's the tempo? What, what are the basic rhythms? What's the groove going to be like? Once that's in place, I'm kind of code switching, if you will, to a place of what does my attention span do when I listen to this for two minutes? And I, loosely speaking, I'm kind of trying to map this out on a, on a grid, if you will, you know? So, so I'll, I'll try to identify the point at which it's getting boring, <laughs> basically. And those are the points at which I try to, you know, either throw in a minor change or a drastic change. And I'm just kind of continually reassessing my emotion, own emotional state as a song is unfolding. So, I mean, if, if someone was just to map out a song and look at, okay, well, I'm going to add a horn section here just to vary things, you know, maybe I'll like, switch up the beat a little bit on this portion, you know, it could be interesting or it could just feel like a, a kitchen sink track. So like, yeah. are you also looking at the journey, the contour of the song as a whole while you're, you're building a track? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I will, I would be lying if I told you that it's uh, more contrived or thought out than it truly is it, 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 in, in actuality it's a messy process. It's really, um, if you've ever done a creative process in which you aren't trying to work on a framework, but you only are, you're working purely on instinct. You're just saying, I'll know, I know when it's right and I know when it's wrong, but I have no idea what right and wrong looks like or sounds like. <laughs> that is effectively what I'm doing is uh, 
just that. I'm, 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 I am literally throwing everything but the kitchen sink at it and then sifting through it. So to use a, to il illustrate that point, if you were to load up any of the songs that, you know, I've, the studio is filled with these, you know, zip disks from that go on the MPC. If you were to load up any programs off of those zip disks, you'll invariably hear alternate um, sequences, alternate choruses, alternate sounds, stuff that didn't make it into the song. And so, you know, like for Ghostwriter, when the horns drop, for example, there was different things that were tried in place of that. And that was the thing that stuck. But I am it, almost at every turn of a song trying to throw at least two or three options at the song to see which one fits best. So is that usually like different sounds or, or um, you know, different production techniques or, or what, what's the palette in, involved? Or my, what, you know, what's involved with the palette, I should say. Sure, sure. My general approach is to go as drastic as I can and then scale things back. So one of the advantages of coming at this from a point of being a, a from the from like a DJ mentality is when I was making Dead Rainer, I would literally in my head think of things like the transition point in songs when things kind of swing from one place to another and is fairly radical. In my head, that was like a DJ transition. It was like cutting in a new record in a DJ set. And so that's kind of my benchmark is, you know, if I'm coming up on, again, to use the, the horns and ghost rider, the chorus, quote unquote, if you, approaching that moment in the song where that, that part gets introduced, in my head, at that the one of the horns is a new song that just happens to be in the same key in the BPM of what was happening before, but I want it to be as different as possible. I want it to be as contrasting as possible. So in a perfect world, I mean, there's, mo there's things I can think of like on the Iceberg record where those things happen and they're, everything changes. It's, it's uh, the, the drums change, the, the synths become guitars and the bass becomes this and blah, 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 and, and so on and so forth. And there's times where that works and at times it doesn't, but usually I try to go too radical and then if it's not working or it's just too much, scale it back. That's super cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like actually writing for a vocalist and okay. uh, lessons that, that uh, people might be able to learn from like tips for that. So when you're writing for a vocalist, the advice you often hear is that you need to build in like sonic space into your productions to make room, you know, like, not taking up too much of the frequency range where vocals might be. Um, so when you're making instrumentals, is that idea of leaving space like less important or do your tracks still need breathing room? You know, it's, it's a very common comment that I've had with vocalists. Um, so I, I don't want to be, I don't want to sound like a con contrarian for its own sake, but I do also feel the need to point out that there are also rappers and vocalists who don't share that. They don't want the floor cleared for them. I mean, I, I've worked with several rappers that they literally want the opposite. They want to feel like they're mm -hmm. fighting the beat. They're, they, they want something that's commanding. You know, I think of a song like Annie Up by M.O.P. is a perfect example of a thing where that beat is so dominating of the sonic space in the song. And it, it, it because of what the song is and the tone of it and the mood and the content it's it's a perfect song in my opinion but the you know it wouldn't it's not the kind of song that you would make if you were following that sort of paradigm of like oh let's make space you, you know what I mean so sure. in my experience will that work sometimes yes but I also I, I don't like being boxed in right from the start especially when I'm collaborating I feel more. I feel most comfortable when I'm throwing five ideas at a vocalist, and they're saying three or four of these don't work, you know. And and I like that because that means that we've identified a border or a threshold, or I'm I'm pushing up against the boundaries for them of their comfort zone, and that's where I want to be. I don't want to be so solidly within their comfort zone that neither of us is getting pushed in any way. That's my personal, you know take on 
Well, I really like that idea of like the intensely collaborative nature of wh what you're talking about, this process of throwing all those ideas at the vocalist. Because I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not a creator myself, but I think I may have this false idea that a lot of times with hip hop, it's like the producer creates a beat and then the rapper raps over it. And there might be some back and forth, of course, to like make sure that, you know, if there's some kind of chorus that it, it hits just right. But I envision it as like, there's this beat that sort of comes prepackaged and that's what you're responsible for. And then the rapper is responsible for, you know, the lyrics and the, and the flow and, and the vocal com component. Uh, but what you're talking about is much more involved with, than that. Yeah, and to be clear, a lot of times what you're referring, the workflow that you're referring to is how things play out. That That is, the I would say, the most common way in which rap records are made. But just because it is the most common way, it doesn't mean that to me it's the best way or the way that you know all records should happen. I, I like when rappers are pushing maybe not pushing back is is that might not be the right term but i i like it when they're like hey can i hear this without this or can you try it without this or you know they're involved i want them to be involved in you know the crafting of the song personally so you've shared your wisdom at our ascap experience conference in the past and you've got a new course out called rjd2 from samples to songs with our member benefits partner soundfly can you tell us a little bit about the course and also why it's important to you to mentor up and coming writer producers? Sure. Um, so to touch on the, the course and what we cover there, um, it is uh, me doing my best to walk someone through the process of take going from basically nothing to something as it come, as it relates to composing sample based music. Um, so, but we do that in a, in a much more granular manner with actual songs and Pro Tools sessions and MPC sessions and, you know, really trying to walk through uh, as much of the concepts behind taking something from just, a, you know, a sample source to a, a full-blown song. Um, and the why of that is I, you know, when I was young, I didn't really have a, a mentor as it relates to music production. I, I kind of had to figure most of this stuff out on my own. You know, I was uh, literally just reading manuals on how machines worked and kind of fumbling around. And it, it probably took a lot longer than it would have if I had a, a mentor or community or something to, to look to, you know, to, to kind of get things going. And, uh, so because of that, as much as I can give back, as much as I can provide to other people, you know, whether it's people who are wanting to do this professionally or if you, you just want to do this for fun and get some kind of insight into, you know, what this type of music production is really all about, uh, I, I see no benefit in keeping that information to myself uh, and, and, and dying with it. You know, I, I would rather it be shared and out in the world while I still can share. Awesome. Well, we are more than happy to help you spread the gospel <laughs> while you're still here awesome. and beyond. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. For our sweet 16th year, the ASCAP experience is bringing you an all new slate of programming to help you amp up your creativity, polish your music making skills, and better understand how the money flows in the music business. We have more great sessions and special guests scheduled throughout October, so don't miss out on this free opportunity to boost your music career. Visit ASCAPExperience.com for updates and to RSVP. You'll be glad you did. And that, as they say, is a wrap. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, our special guests Diane Warren and RJ D2, as well as my colleagues John Tita and Aton Rosenblum. Shoutouts to Tiffany Sims for graphic design, Kate Cordova for social media magic, Sam Hollander and Josh Edmondson for our cool theme music, and Benjamin Keynes of SightSense Productions for audio and video editing. Stay safe, keep the music flowing, see you soon.